All right, we'll go ahead and get started uh, this evening uh, so that we can uh, all make dinner tonight and uh, eat something good. Uh, or maybe that's just me that hasn't ate yet, but we're going to make this happen. Uh, so for all those joining online, we welcome them, welcome you to online Bible study tonight. Uh, I want to make a couple just uh, housekeeping announcements. Uh, for those who have not already done so, most of you have, so that's a good thing. But if you have not yet made an expression to work vacation Bible school, we are getting towards crunch time. We're going to order it. We're going to need to start ordering shirts and things like that to get them in. So we don't want you to miss and not have a shirt to match everybody else because you'll look kind of weird if you don't have a shirt. So we don't want you to feel awkward. So we need you to sign up for that uh, for VBS 2022. Uh, we will be serving dinner each night. The menu's been planned out. We're going to have sign-up sheets for people to start bringing items and collecting items. And hopefully they'll be in, out this week or, or sometime for us to be able to get you all that. But we need chips. We need, uh, not chips, we need hot dog buns. We need hot dogs. We need condiments. We need all kinds of stuff. So a lot of fun stuff happening there uh, with that. But that is June the 5th or the 9th. So start inviting somebody. Tell them about it. We'll try to get you little postcard type things made hopefully as well, where you can pass them out, take them around the world, share the gospel, and tell them to come to Vacation Bible School. We're collecting cardboard boxes. Some of you have already put it on Facebook and have asked people to help. Some have already expressed interest in helping. But if you see a cardboard box or any other box or anything else, uh, we will collect them. Brother Dennis and uh, Brother Henry, our master engineers of cardboard, are going to figure out how to make a castle out of all this stuff um, and probably some other materials we don't know not, uh, yet we're going to be using. Uh, so we're going to have a lot, we've got engineers, professional ones that are going to have this thing looking pretty super duper when this is all said and done. So uh, make sure you, if you have any of that, see Miss Jennifer or let her know what you need. Also, let me quickly, I'll plug this again on Sunday, um, again, uh, all about camp meeting. Camp meeting is going to be a little bit different this year. Uh, we always uh, kind of affects our schedules a little bit. Uh, because of camp meeting. So on Sunday night of camp meeting, which is June the 12th, that is also uh, going to be the BBS commencement, if you will, uh, Sunday, where camp meeting falls on. So we have Vacation Bible School. Sunday morning, we're going to have our big BBS commencement. woo your kids are going to be here. We're going to sing their songs. We're going to tell them how awesome they are. We're going to give them their crafts. We're going to tell you that we only have $3 million in damages because of what we tore up, but we're going to fix it before next week. It's going to be awesome, and uh, it's going to be great. Uh, that afternoon, soon as church is over, I'm going to say, I love y'all, I'm leaving. Uh, I'm going to camp meeting. <laughs> so uh, I'll be at camp meeting. So I won't have church. We won't have church that Sunday night. We have been in church for eight day, well, six, six days by that point. We will have had Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night. Took off Friday and Saturday. Come back on Sunday. You'll be in revival with children. You'll want a break. Trust me, you will. You'll thank me for that. But so that Sunday night, we won't have uh, uh, services uh, we're still working on Wednesday night. If we can get coverage, you will have Wednesday night service here. I won't be here, but you'll have Wednesday night services, Wednesday night service here if we can work. If not, you can always stream the camp meeting this year. They have quite a, uh, a powerful lineup this year. A couple of the general officials are preaching. Uh, Pastor Loran Livingston, the pastor of the Central Church of God out of Charlotte, North Carolina, dynamic preacher. He's preaching on Wednesday night. Um, Dr. David Griffiths is preaching, I think, on Monday night. Dr. J. David Stevens on Tuesday night. Anyway, long story short, there's a lot of good speakers, so you're not going to want to miss it. But it won't be, we'll try our best to put the link up on our church Facebook page so you can follow it. But uh, when you get in that big metal tabernacle, service gets a little little shaky unless you're on the, the Church of God themselves internet services and they don't really give out their passwords because they're trying to limit so they can stream better quality but you can go to the South Carolina Church of God Facebook page there will be a link there and you can watch it so you just literally type in like you would look anybody else up South Carolina Church of God it'll pull it up if you can't find it but anyway we'll make mention of that again on Sunday also Sunday is the deadline for me to uh, to know who is going to be going to senior adult retreat we got most we got people signed up but I'll need to know by Sunday because by Monday I will have to register we already have booked your hotel rooms. We already kind of know what they're going to be. Uh, right now, uh, the hotels, with it's all said and done, uh, we're waiting on tax and everything else. But it's probably going to run you somewhere around, per room, it's going to be about somewhere between 90 to 100 bucks. But now, again, that's not per person. That's per room. So when you put two people in a room, 
at 50 a person or 45 a person. You put three people in a room, it goes to $33 a person. If you put four to a room, you only hear about a quarter of the bill. So you can pay 25 bucks. So it's a good day for you. It depends on how you want to do it. But it's that Friday, May 27th and 28th, that Saturday. We'd love for all who can to go. If you watch grandchildren for that week, tell your children, hey, look, I love my grandchild, but you know what? I want to go have fun for a weekend. So you're going to figure this out because I want to go and, and have a good time. And you'll, you won't regret it. I'm telling you, we're going to have a lot of fun. It's going to be awesome if you're over 55. If you're under 55, I'm sorry, you can't go. Um, but, you know, maybe when you turn 55, we'll still be doing it. So it would be great for you. So, uh, um, but most of you are probably close enough that you could qualify. So uh, you should sign up if you'd like to go. It's going to be a lot of fun. I also will need to know the final numbers because we have to transport you there. So obviously we need to know the final numbers so I can start working on securing the proper vehicles needed to make sure we get there all safely in one piece and all that stuff. So make sure you sign up for that. Uh, we'll cover your registration. The only thing you're responsible for is your portion of the hotel room, depending on how many people you like versus how many people you don't like staying in your room, and just your lunch on Friday and your lunch on Saturday. That's all you got to worry about. We feed you Friday night dinner at the, at the, conference, at the conference, and we feed you Saturday morning uh, for breakfast. Uh, they're at the hotel, and they have snacks and all kinds of continental things throughout the Saturday morning. Saturday morning, most of that day, you'll spend playing things like let's make a deal, spin the wheel of fortune, and win money, and then about 10.30 or so, It'll be a Southern Gospel concert at 12 o'clock. We're going home. We're eating. On Friday night, you'll go from 2 o'clock to about 5 o'clock. They'll have orientation, and you'll be winning prizes, and you'll be hearing some comedian, and you'll be playing games, and you'll be winning all kinds of things like BioFreeze or whatever else they give to that people at that day. I don't know what they give. It's just a joke. But I don't know. But maybe, maybe one year we did give one year we did give out a 64 count roll of toilet paper for somebody who won. It's like a gag gift, but she was super excited about it. She actually traded. She could the, she could take a hundred bucks, or she could trade it in for the gag gift, and she did it. And we felt so bad. We told her we'd trade her back. She didn't take the hundred dollars. She kept the toilet paper. It was crazy how that works. But you know, desperate times call for desperate measures. But anyway, so that to be said, you'll play games like that, um, and then on Friday you'll eat dinner around five o'clock. Normally it's some kind of, you know, like catered type thing. Sometimes it's been barbecue, sometimes it's been chicken, sometimes it's been all kinds. But it's some kind of catered meal that you'll eat right there at the tabernacle on each wing. They'll separate us in two things. And then at 6.30, between 6.30 and 7, Dr. Tim Hill, General Oversight Church of God's coming in. Not to preach, but he's coming to do in a, a concert and all that stuff. And... Uh, the exciting part about that is, is uh, we need to leave pretty much on that Friday as soon as possible, so probably somewhere between 9 and 10, because I have to be there to meet Dr. Hill, because I have to play for Dr. Hill to sing. So I don't know what I'm doing yet. I just got called this week and said, hey, he's calling for you, and you need to show up. And I'm like, all right, I'm supposed to be driving seniors. And they were like, well, then tell him to get up early. I was like, all right, I will do my best. Thank you so much. It's been good talking to you, too as his secretary. Anyway, I didn't really talk to him, just some secretary. But anyway, point to be made, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we're going to have a great weekend, so you're not wanna, going to want to miss it. So we'll make sure of that as well uh, in terms of that. Now, let's uh, go. We're going to have a couple things I want to pray about, and then we'll get moving along. Um, Bonnie took another chemo treatment yesterday, thank the Lord, but her hemoglobin's due to the, uh, the medicine she's on. It affects the hemoglobin, so she went down from 8.0 uh, 8, uh, to 7.1, which is not what they want. They want to stay above 8. Um, so she had to have some drug transfusions, which they were able to do at uh, the same day. The Lord worked it out. It, normally you have to make another appointment, but they had a cancellation, and it just it fit, and God showed her mercy and grace, and she got to have it. But that being said, she still doesn't need it to keep dropping during this situation. Uh, Sister Laura May is doing pretty good, other than just, just being Sister Laura May. Uh, uh, she's driving uh, her caregivers a little little over the top sometimes, but she's loving life and thinks that she's going to one day be all by herself again and that life's going to be great at north of 90 plus years. So uh, she needs prayer because she is a little um, sluggish on her feet. Uh, she tries to bite off a little bit more than she can chew sometimes, like getting up in the middle of the night to wash dishes when everybody is sleeping. That's not what we want. Uh, but she says she can do it. So anyway, so she needs prayer as well. Uh, Brianna's dad found out today he has double pneumonia in both lungs, uh, to, and so he is a pretty sick fellow. 
uh, he is um, uh, taking, I don't remember all the antibiotics they got him on, it's like a laundry list, but anyway, a double pneumonia in, uh, in each one, uh, pneumonia, pneumonia in each lung, so he's a pretty sick guy. Uh, her nephew, uh, the, the baby version of the nephew, has some uh, abnormalities and some blood work that we're not sure what that means, so we're having to go, they're having to go uh, see some specialists to try to get some more further testing done, and we're hoping there's nothing major, but we still don't know what it is, so baby Sawyer needs prayer as well. Uh, and so obviously uh, this weekend is Mother's Day. There's a lot of folks. This is the first Mom's Day without mom. This is, see, for some people, a reminder that they don't have mom uh, and other things. So it's always while we celebrate moms, for some people it's kind of a sad day. So we want to pray for all the people um, dealing with that as well. Uh, continue to pray for Sister Dale, uh, who is still battling some, some things in her health. Pray for Pastor Ard, who's still dealing with some back issues and some things with him. Uh, pray for her sister Carlsey. Sister Carlsey is sick with some kind of stomach uh, issue. She got sick this morning. We don't really know what. We don't. We think it's just maybe a 24-hour bug. We're not really sure because she nobody else really is sick. But Brother Carlsey is supposed to be preaching Sunday uh, for his granddaughter uh, for Mother's Day because she just recently been appointed the uh, pastor of the Johnsonville Church last weekend. He is preaching for her for Mother's Day. That's uh, Sunday. I think she's actually pregnant too. So it's kind of she's bringing her family in. But, obviously, he don't want to get sick, doesn't want his mom to get sick, or Sister Carlsey to still be sick. So, they're kind of just all quarantining themselves and praying for hedge of protection around them as well. So, she is not feeling too well. Katrina was sick on Sunday. She's feeling a little bit better, but she was sick on Sunday. That's why she wasn't here uh, and is hoping to, she said, hopefully to be back soon, just trying to get over that. Andrew is on his way to New Mexico uh, to take his family member who uh, he has been dealing with to a uh, to hopefully to a hell, a house to help with some of his situation uh, and uh, going to drop him off in Texas and while he's waiting on him for that situation he's going to go to New Mexico and see his siblings out there so he'll be gone for the next month while he's dealing with all that he's out of school now but he's going to be gone for the next month trying to help this particular family member hopefully beat their their inner demons that they're facing right now and uh, hopefully will salvage if the Lord's will, a marriage, and make sure that there is a father still to raise his three children. So uh, so he's got his hands full right now with that in Texas, uh, and so he asked for us to be praying for that as well, um, and so uh, he has that going. So um, there's not a lot going on, but that's all I have so far for you. So, uh, yes, sir. All right. All right, any others on this side before I move to the other? Yes, ma'am. We're so glad you're back. Even if it took the doctor visit, we appreciate it. Miss Jeannie's here tonight. She's real sick, but she's got some antibiotics. She's not 100%, but she is on the mend, so we're thankful that she's back and able to be here because Sunday was not looking good for her. So we're glad she's able to be back. Any others? Carson, yes. Okay. Yes, and he is battling some cancer. Yes, all right. Carson and Sue. Any others on this side? All right, any on this side? Hmm? Okay. All right, we'll pray for him as well. Pastors of St. George, Church of God for us. Up there. Any others? Remember Brother Man, he started his job yesterday, I do believe. So he's in a transitionary period of new. Did he get started get start yesterday? Uh, well, well, we're going to pray that it gets better. It gets sweeter as the days go by for him. But, good news is he will eventually go to Knights, so one day one day he'll get there. Um, all right, any others? David.
Harvey. All right. Sure. Remember one of our pastors in the upstate, his dad had a massive heart attack. He's an older senior adult, retired pastor in our state, but had a massive heart attack. He's on life support as well up there, uh, waiting to see what effects that had on his on him. So I pray for him as well. Any others? that one either. Sure. All right. All right. Well, if there's not any others, let's stand uh, this evening and let you rest on your feet for a moment. And uh, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. And then uh, immediately following that, we'll, uh, we'll jump right into Bible study. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you today for your love, mercy, and grace. We thank you. You're a very present help in time of trouble. Father, I pray for the needs that have been brought before the attention of the body tonight. There are so, so many. Uh, Lord, there's there's no way that we probably could remember every one of them in the details that they were given. But Lord, we know you're a healer. We know you're a deliverer. We know you're a sustainer of life. We know you're a way maker. We know you're the promise keeper. We know you're able to do exceedingly abundantly above that which we can think or comprehend. We know, God, that whatever we commit to your care, before we've even thought about it, before we even ask it, before we've even said it, you already knew about it. And so tonight, Lord, as two or three, your word says two or three agree is touching any one thing, you were there. And we are, as a corporate body of believers, are here tonight to ask for you to intervene and seek your face in these situations. And so, Lord, I pray for every situation, whether it is healing, whether it is people battling cancer, battling sickness in the hospital, life support. Lord, whether it's people, Lord, that are, that are we thank you for the ones that are already becoming, beginning to get, come over the sickness they've already had, but still having some lingering effects. Lord, we have people that have unspoken requests, people that have needs in their lives. And Lord, we know that you are able. We pray for every man, woman, boy, or girl, Lord, this weekend that will be in our services, that will be in uh, the churches surrounding areas, uh, their services as well. Lord, there will be people sitting on our pews and in our auditoriums that will be without a mother this year, or they'll be without a grandmother or a spouse, they will, they'll be missing a loved one, and Lord, while we celebrate, uh, Lord, our mothers this weekend, some will feel the pain of what it's like not to have them with them anymore, but Lord, we know you are a, a Lord that is a comforter and a friend, and Lord, as we get ready to break the bread of life, we ask that you would speak to our hearts and let us hear from your word, and Lord, forever we commit these things into your loving arms and care, in Christ's name we pray and ask these things. The people of God together said amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. We're going to go back to Matthew chapter 28. We're going to kind of, this is kind of our theme scripture. It's the same one we read last week and, and the uh, uh, great commissional mandate by God. We've been talking uh, for a couple weeks. We've been on this idea of the nine traits of an outwardly focused Christian. How to move from I am to an attitude of I will. We've talked about things like I will serve, I will grow, I will go, I will worship. Uh, we've talked about things like uh, I will not drop out, I will give, uh, things like that. And so we're going to pick up another one uh, tonight, uh, another thing, how to go from I am to I will and what that means. Here's what the word of the Lord says. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into the mountain where Jesus had appointed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted him. These are people that... They were a faith. They had seen him do this thing called resurrection. They had seen him die. Yet some of them were still not sure this was all what it's cracked up to be. Then he came to them and he said to them, All power has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Therefore I need you to go and I need you to teach them. I need you to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them everything I've taught you. Everything I've said. I need you to do the same thing. Go, go replicate. Yeah, I, I don't want you to duplicate it, I want you to replicate it, uh, because you can't necessarily duplicate Christ, because Christ is in and of himself, he's the supreme, and we can, we can be very similar to him, we can replicate what he teaches us, but there's nobody that will ever be like Jesus completely, we can emulate him to a certain degree, but we'll never be perfect, we never will be the carbon copy of Jesus, but he said, well, I want you to replicate and emulate me by telling them the same commands, and, and telling them how to worship, and how to serve me, and he said, but I'll be with you always. 
even until the end of the world, even until I come back, even when I come back to, to take you home with me, uh, I will, you will be uh, with me to the end. I've been reading a couple, uh, for the last couple of weeks, and, and I've had this, um, I don't know, this new intrigue about heaven. And uh, I've always heard people talk about heaven, I've always heard people preach about heaven, uh, sing about heaven, uh, and all that stuff. But over the last couple of weeks, my mind has just been really uh, engrossed with the idea of heaven. And so I had two or three books that, uh, that had been in my library, some that I had vaguely like thumbed through and read, you know, quickly read, like, a, you know, more like speed reading, not really read, read, but more thumb through, get ideas out of it, and get different concepts and Bible study material out of. And some I had not even cracked the book, I just had them, but they were on the shelf, got lost in the shuffle, and so I pulled a couple of them out and been trying to read them and things like that. And, and, and some of them, uh, some of the authors are very clear that, that, you know, hey, some of this is just my vivid imagination, I'm going by what the scripture says, and while I, they feel like they can argue it apologetically, they said, you know, okay, so we don't know every detail because John the Revelator said, I really can't describe it to you. It's something I really can't describe. We know about the, the, the Bema seat of Christ, which is the, the, the judgment of, our, of the Christian faith. There are two different judgments when we, got, when we go to heaven. There will be two different judgments. There's the great white throne judgment, and then there's the Bema seat judgment. They're two separate. You want to make sure you go to the Bema seat judgment because the great white throne judgment is for all the people that don't know Jesus. That's where they get basically sentenced to eternal damnation. They get, they get sentenced for the works they did not do and things like that. The Bema seat of Christ is where we go to be judged for the works as Christians, where we get our rewards. The Bible talks about rewards and crowns and robes. I don't know how many crowns. I don't know how many jewels. I don't know what the robes will look like. But I, I got intrigued because in the, with one author we were, I was reading behind. And again, I don't know all the details. But he talks about that in the, all throughout the book of Revelation, you hear this idea of a new heaven and a new earth. And you hear this idea of life, eternal life. Well, when you talk about life, we, you think you're living forever. Now, for some people, they think living forever is all we're going to do, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, metaphorically speaking, since there's no time, it's not really 24-7. But they think all we're going to do is just sit before the throne and cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God all day long. Well, I started thinking about that thing. While that sounds good and exciting, that also sounds boring for eternity. Like I'm all about worshiping Jesus. But think about it. If it's for eternity, I just have to sit in the same position for the rest of my life over and over. To me, that gets redundant. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that when I get to heaven... The Bible talks about I have a new body to be glorified. The Bible talks about it gives us inclination. The Bible kind of gives inclination that, that our glorified bodies will somewhat be recognizable because the Bible talks about how people will go up to Peter and they'll go up to Paul and they'll, they'll have conversations. And we know that the, the young man when he died and he went, or the, the, rich young, or the rich ruler when he died and went to hell, he looked up and he noticed Abraham. He said, can I talk to Lazarus? So there's, the Bible gives us like this, this idea that some folks might be, once you get to heaven, recognizable. And you've heard people say, can't wait to see my mama or my daddy when I get there and things like that. And I don't know how we'll know, but somehow maybe we'll know. But I started thinking about life. Like, what if? Now, this is not biblical in terms of I can't prove it. But we know that, that, that heaven is designed in a cube, cubicle shape in terms of cubed, and it has different dimensions and layers, and, and the Bible talks about the different, different ways. What if, what if we, there's, like, life? Like, I'm, when I say life, like, what if we get to do stuff when we're in heaven? Like, not only, not only praise the Lord, but what if, like, there really is, when we talk about the marriage supper of the Lamb, like, we really get to go eat good food somewhere. That sounds like, now it sounds like heaven. You tell me I can eat good, good food, now nah, we're talking about going to heaven, all right? What if there's life? What if there's, the Bible talks about that, that, that there, are, there are animal creatures like, you know, the lion and the, and the, and the lay down by the lamb, and it talks about the beasts that have faces like humans and wings and they're built like a lion, but they worship the Lord too, which got me to thinking, what if there's animals in heaven? For some people, that will be heaven. There, what if, what if when you get to heaven, think about it. You might be allergic to animals on earth, but you're not allergic when you get to heaven. So, like, what if animals were there? Or what if, what if we could do things while we're in heaven? But the reality, I say all that to say this because when I started thinking about this idea of heaven, one of the things that crossed my mind when I started having this new intrigue about heaven is how many people will miss it. How many people think they're going to get to see all this cool stuff? Whether it's 
truly animals in heaven, whether it's we have multiple dimensions, whether we can teleport from the new heaven and new earth and go down and <coughs> excuse me, reign with the millennial reign of Christ, or whether we can, you know, literally eat food in heaven at the marriage supper, or whether we actually really get to go fishing in the sea of life or whatever. I don't know what it'll be like, whatever it may look like. But I started thinking about it, no matter how great it is and how incomprehensible it is that I can't wrap my mind around it, there's a lot of people who think they'll get to experience it. They won't. They won't even get to experience whatever heaven looks like. They'll be like that, that rich man who ended up thinking he had done enough, but his works and his money and everything else wasn't enough. He didn't accept Jesus. And so in the reality of it, he missed heaven, whatever heaven may look like. Now, there might be, you know, some people who, you know, again, we don't know exactly all of the dimensional things and events of heaven. But whatever it is, we know John said, you can't explain it. You can't wrap your mind around it. I can't, I can't, I mean, think about it. Streets of gold. Like, we'll never have to drive on pothole infested roads again. You'll never have to get in a wheel alignment on your car ever again. You won't have to put gas in your car right now praise the Lord for that there is no gas stations in heaven and even if there were it's free gas you didn't pay for it streets of gold like you're really gonna you're just gonna walk along and visit neighbors walking on gold plated streets we can't even afford cheap asphalt in Berkeley County <laughs> think about that for a minute you're gonna have mansions why would God build us a mansion if we never get to go home I've always thought about that. Oh, in my house, Father's house, there's many mansions. When I, sort of, I go to prepare places. Well, I got a house, but God, I got to stay at the throne. I got to say holy, holy, holy all day. That's a waste of building materials. You shouldn't have built a house. I can't even go home. Who wants to build a house they can't live in? So what? So obviously, maybe if there's going to be mansions, maybe I get like a certain day of the week, I get to, okay, you're gonna, you're, I can not come to church this day. I can not come to church on Monday. I can enjoy heaven today. I'll come back on Tuesday for round two. But, but we're going to have mansions. We're going to have neighbors. But you got to get there to experience it. And there's some people, good, bad, or indifferent, they'll never see heaven. They'll never get to see heaven. They'll never experience heaven. They'll never get to enjoy heaven. We talked about things in this series about not dropping out of fellowship and church and giving. But I want to talk tonight about how to avoid traps because... One of the things I think that's happened to the body of Christ, and I'm going to talk about our church, I'm not even universally that's happened, is this. Is if we're not careful, the devil will trip us up and he'll put us, he'll trap us and we don't even realize we've been put in a trap. I was thinking about this when I was formulating and finalizing today's uh, message for tonight. I thought about an animal trap. I go visit Brother W. Gamblin, which is Miss Lalafay's husband, every week. And uh, they have uh, a couple cats or whatever, but they have raccoons that keep coming and taking their stuff out of their yard. And these squirrels and other things that are a nuisance, trying to eat, eat the bird feeders and everything else. And so a couple weeks ago, she, shot out a, she set out a trap. She caught one. She took it out to Cypress Gardens area and she released it or whatever. But I thought about it. I've seen, I've seen Brianna's family do it. I've seen my grandparents do it. I've seen other people do it. It's amazing to me how this, these traps work. For the animal... Whatever they intended, whether it's the cheese, whether it's the peanut butter, whether it's the cat food. Whether, at the end of the trap, from me to that wall over there, it looks like all i got to do is walk straight into that, grab some food, and walk out. What they don't recognize is the trigger. They go walking right up to it. They look at it. They look at it. They look at it. They look at it. And for long, some of them are smart enough. They realize, I've done this before. This ain't worth the food. And they run off. But the young whippersnappers, the young... The, the youthful, if you will, ones are like, oh, they, I'm too quick. They won't catch me. I'm the gingerbread man. And they run into it. And by the time they get to the bowl, <laughs> it clamps down on them. And then they, like, go psycho in this cage. They're trapped. You've often heard people say, some people feel like, you know, they're like a, a, a caged cat. You put a cat in a cage. You watch what happens to them. They lose their minds. You hear all kinds of shrieking and sounds and scratches and claws. You go to the zoo and, I mean, you go to the circus and you see the tigers and the lions and those little, those little cages. And you, 
you know, it's great when they come out, but when they're sitting in the back, man, they're trying to knock the trailer over, trying to get out of the thing. But that's how the devil works. In fact, the Bible tells us that we are to be cognizant, cognizant and cautious because the devil will set out traps and snares. That's why the Bible says, you know, when we run this race, do not be so easily entangled or ensnared. Don't let the devil trip you up or trap you like the snare of the fowler. Because the devil will... Some, I, I, I used to watch the, the old, uh, like movies and stuff back in the day where the guy would be walking in the woods and he'd step. It looked like a little vine just standing in the middle of the road. And he'd just step in and by that thing, that vine would whoosh, wrap around his leg and pull him up. And he'd be dangling in the tree waiting for them. the people to come out. The little, the little bush people would come out and their little pitchfork. They finally caught on somebody. A little, you know, little homemade trap. See, some people don't realize that the devil does that. He is sneaky. It's kind of he sets up traps for us to become victimized. And some people, they might get trapped on this earth, and the Lord might save them, deliver them, or other people might help them get out of that. But some people are going to get tripped up and messed up, and they're going to trap themselves out of missing, uh, trap themselves to the point they'll miss eternity because of it, because they were not discerning and wise and prudent to the things of this world. See, the devil doesn't just come at us sometimes full throttle and say, hey, by the way, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to kill you, so you want to do this or not? No, he don't tell us point blank. That's not how he works. He's crafty. He's cunning. He didn't go up to Eve and Adam and say, by the way, after you eat this fruit, God's going to kick you out. He's going to make you be miserable when you have children. And you're going to be working to, like a dog. You're going to be working 80 hours a week and only getting paid for 40, and then they're going to tell you they may, not even need you. they may not even pay you for those 40. That's what you're going to do. But, hey, I hope you enjoyed this piece of fruit. That's not what he said to him. He made it sound like it was something great. You'd be like God. You, you're going to be wise. He made it sound good. He didn't tell them all the repercussions. It's like taking a drug. I know none of y'all in here have to take any kind of drugs. Y'all are all healthy and don't take water pills or anything else. Y'all don't take no drugs in here. But for some people in the world that do have to take occasionally over-the-counter medicine, the doctor always tells you, now this is going to lower your blood sugar. That's all he wants to tell you. He don't want to tell you the side effects. That's right, your blood sugar will get lower, but you're going to have liver disease, you're going to have congestive heart failure, you're going to, have, you're going to grow a third arm, you're going to have 14 toes, you're going to, your hair is going to turn, turn to curls, you didn't even have curly hair, but it will curl now, and you're going to have you know, all kinds of different limbs, you're going to have three eyeballs, your eyes are going to change, you're going to be like a cyclops, one eye is going to look one way, one's going to look the other, uh, one eye will turn green, one's going to be blue, but you don't have low, you'll have low blood sugar. Like, wow, I'll take my chances not eating any more little Debbie cakes before I have multicolored eyes here, doctor. They don't want to tell you that. You go read the back of these drugs. You know, I was, I, I'm always amazed when you have to pick up something at, yeah, the, at the pharmacy. They say, you need to have a consultation. Can you go here for a moment? And, uh, you're going to have to have, be con have a consultation with the, with the pharmacist. She'll come, do you have any questions with the drugs? You know, most people, I hear them all the time. No, I don't have any. They didn't even ask. You know, the dosage, you take twice a day with water before meals, whatever. And they're like, you have any other questions? And they're like, no, no, that's, that's fine. They walk out the door with this, you know, 14-page document stapled to it that you have to read. Who goes home and reads that? Nobody. I have always want to be the person when I walk up and say, do you have any questions? Yes. What's going to happen when I take it? I don't care about feeling better. I want to know the bad parts. All of a sudden, am I going to have like some kind of like triple gastric bypass surgery when this is all said and done over this? Like, what's going to happen to me? I want to know the I want to know the side effects. Am I going to Am I going to like have three ears instead of two? Because I have two big ones already. I don't need a third one. I don't need extra ones. They're, they're, you're already out there far enough as it is. That's what I want to know. That's how the devil is. The devil tells you the good stuff. He don't tell you the side effects from what you take when he gets you trapped. The devil only tells you, well, this is going to sound wake you wise. This is going to make you feel good. This is, sin is pleasurable, isn't it? It's going to be great. You're going to enjoy it. He doesn't tell you how the repercussions are when the sin wears off or when God calls in for the punishment of that sin. And so what we're talking about, we're talking about traps. Here's some traps people fall victimized to. Some people fall victimized to churchianity. Churchianity is literally this, the idea of practicing church and religious belief according to human standards rather than biblical guidelines. It is learning how to perfect church without God being involved. That's churchianity. And I would be remiss if I did not say to you that there is more churchianity going on in the world than we realize. There's a lot of people that have mastered the art of how to make church feel like church, but it's not church. There's people that know how to do the right songs know how to have the right lights, know how to preach the right message or twist, you know, say the message in a certain way to make people feel good about themselves or whatever else. But, but there's a lot of churches that they've perfected it so much with their lights and their sound and their program and all this stuff, they miss one element, God. 
Somehow he got shuffled out of the mix when we perfected this craft we call church. See, when church no longer has the God card, it is not church, it's a country club. A country club is I pay some money, I get to reap the benefits of the club that I'm involved in. Well, in the church we call that tithes. So when God's not in the equation, I get to come and enjoy a concert. I get to come and enjoy the amenities of being a part of the country club, hear the motivational speech. I'll pay a couple dollars into the tithe fund. And when something bad happens, they'll send me flowers. They'll send me chocolate. They'll send me something in the mail. And, and, and all is great. That's a country club mentality. That's not a church. In fact, in actuality, the early church uh, was a lot different than the way we do church now. Nothing wrong with screens, lights, all that stuff. Nothing wrong with that. But church in the old days, in the inception of the church, was at homes, was on foot, was door-to-door evangelism, knocking on doors, beating doors down. Early church services included jail ministries because most of the church was in it. <laughs> that hard, it's not really hard to have a jail ministry when the entire congregation is in jail. <laughs> it's pretty easy. Church, mini- church ministry 101. Uh, jail ministry, the early church was persecuted, they were being killed, they were being ostracized for their faith. That was church. It wasn't this frou-frou, warm, fuzzy feelings and everybody gets a gift for participating this week in church. No, it wasn't like that at all. The early church, everybody didn't get Kool-Aid and goldfish. <laughs> they got bread and water in a dungeon. A lot different than children's church or youth church or senior adult church today. How different? They didn't have air conditioning buildings and padded pews. They walked for miles, sat out in the heat, sat on the grassy seashore, sat on the grassy hillside. They didn't have the amenities of day. And we have all these amenities and we still can't get people to go to church. Shocking. Thousands flogged, thousands came, thousands upon thousands came to sit on the sandy seashore or the grassy hillsides to hear the word. With no instruments Maybe a handful of instruments, but no sound system and no major TV production studio. Nowadays, we got all the amenities in the world, and they're like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not, it's not for me. <laughs> Maybe we should just go back to sitting outside on the beach or sitting outside on the hillsides and just start having church outside all the time, see if it makes a difference. <laughs> in today's society, it would make a difference, all right. What few you have coming to the air conditioning church would even dwindle going to the outside church because we have lost what church is all about the membership of the church has changed from the 1st Corinthians 12 model you can go back and read I'm not going to read 1st Corinthians 12 talks about what it means to be a part of the fellowship of the body of Christ and what membership what we are when we come to the body of Christ what that what that means when we join fellowship one another it is not what you think joining a church is not just so that we give you chicken dinners when somebody in your family dies that's not what membership's about you don't join a church just so that you don't have to pay the uh the fee to use the building for a wedding in somebody in your family. That's not what membership's all about. Or have to avoid the cleaning fee when the wedding is over. That's not what membership's all about. That's perks. That's not the reason you should be a member. You see, the Bible tells us that members of the church are comprised of the whole body and are essential parts of the body. It talks about eyes and hands and feet. Well, we have to do this thing together. It's, it's not about just going around and finding all kinds of cool stuff and getting all kinds of fringe benefits. It's about being able to advance the kingdom of God, going to jobs that I can't go to, going to family members of yours that I don't know, going to friends of yours that I'll never meet, maybe. But after you spend time in church on a Sunday or on a Wednesday, after the message is given, whether it's me or Brother Carlsy or Pastor Art or whoever it may be, or sitting in a Brother Marion or a Brother Randy or a Sister Sandy Sunday school class or whatever it may be, it is then you taking that and you find out who that guy is on Thursday or you find out who that family member is on Friday or you talk to that person that I don't know on Monday and you be the difference maker in their lives. It's the hands and feet of Christ extended. That's what it's about. It's all about sacrifice. That's what the church was designed to be. It was all about sacrifice. So here's, here's a couple symptoms of things I've seen in church. Now, don't throw, don't, don't throw tomatoes at the messenger. These are just some things I have jotted down and wrote down. One of them is the spectator sport. There's a lot of people that go to church for this reason. These are the members who attend, but they don't participate. They just come to watch. They expect everybody else to do the work. 
Well, somebody else will pick up the trash. Somebody else will do the flowers. Somebody else will clean the bathroom. Somebody else will pick up the piece of paper at church. Somebody else will collect the bulletin. Somebody else will turn the lights off. Somebody else will turn the air conditioning off. Somebody else will run the media. Somebody else will cut the grass. Somebody else will pay for the grass to get cut that they don't want to cut. Somebody else will pay the light bill. Somebody else will buy the drinks in the back for the family fest. Somebody else will buy the hot dog bun. Somebody else will buy, will make sure the parking lot is done. Somebody else will spray for the weeds. Somebody else will make sure there is paper products in the back for the dinner. Somebody else will make sure there's toilet paper products for the bathroom. Somebody else will make sure that we have food for this event. Somebody else will, somebody else will, somebody else will. They're only passionate in meetings where they can express their displeasure and anger. These are the people that they only get excited when they can express what they don't like. <laughs> Shocking, I know, but there are people that do that. They'll say nothing until they don't like it. Then they got all kinds of things they want to say. They love church business meeting. They love them. But they also are people that come, that do nothing. To them, church is a spectator event. I come to church. I'm waiting for Miss Sherry to just sing all four verses of that hymn. Not because I don't like the hymn. I don't like hymns. I don't like praise. I don't like none of I just want her to sing it. I'm just coming to watch to see how she does this week. I ain't going to lift my hand. I ain't going to clap. It can be the fastest song. It can be the slowest song. I ain't going to clap. I ain't going to raise my hand. I mean, I'm, not even, I'm so lazy, I'm not even going to pull the hymnal out of the back of the pew and read it on page 92 because I know that they're going to have me so trained and so spoiled that they'll put the words on the screen for me so I ain't even got to use my hands to grab the hymn book. And even though the words are on the screen, I don't even have to say, well, I don't know the words of the song. They in 175 point font. I could read them from the tail race on my boat. They're so big on that screen. But I ain't going to sing because I don't like singing. Well, heaven's going to be real boring for you. Because there's a lot of singing and worship and things that go on in heaven. So if you like silence, you went to the wrong place if you go to heaven. Because there ain't going to be a lot of silence in heaven. There'll be a lot of noise. See, they go to church. But they go to just observe. And what they like to do is take their little bulletin out and chart how many times they sing the chorus, or chart how many times they sing that hymn, write down each hymn, and then come back about six weeks later and be like, y'all know Sister Sherry sang that in January, right? Why are we singing it again in June? Well, I mean, there's only so many hymns in the book. I mean, come on. You, we, we're eventually going to have to replay it. We, we have, at some point, we got to sing when we all get to heaven one more time. I mean, I hate that for you, but it's in the book. We're going to have to sing it. He's twice a year or whatever it may be. Then the people that come back, well, you know, y'all sang that praise chorus 13 times on Sunday. I can't help it. It only had four words. It kind of runs out. You're gonna eventually going to run out of room. There's only four words to the song. See, they, they always look for what's wrong, but they never participate. They just observe. Symptom number two is what I call is the all about me mentality. It's the country club mentality. We talked about it a lot. You serve me. Rather than me serve you. I come and sit here. You make me happy. I want to be fat and happy Christian. I want to just sit around. And I just want to bark orders. And I want everybody else to just take care of me. Because that's what we pay you to do. That's what we pay them to do. It's your job. That's what, we, that's what we pay you to do. So I have some examples. I didn't even put these on the screen. I just thought I'd read them to you right out the book. I thought they sounded better. Because it looks it, looks it, then you could say, I didn't make them up. They're out the book. Right here. Here's some of those Indicative statements of, it's all about me. None of you have ever heard anybody say this. None of you have ever been to a church this happens. In fact, nobody in this church even has ever experienced this. This is for all the other people's churches that we're talking about. I just want y'all to be prepared so when you go to their churches, you can say, see, my pastor talked about y'all. We know what kind of people y'all are. I'm just trying to train you. It's leadership training. Here's some of the word statements. I told the pastor what I wanted him to preach, but he never listens to what I tell him. And the church said amen. <laughs> Number two. I don't like the temperature in the worship center. Can they not get the air conditioning or the heat under control? If not, they need to find someone or put a lockbox on it so they can get it under control. I don't pay to be miserable. <laughs> amen. If we don't change our music style, I'm not coming back. I'll find another church that sings what I want and meets my needs. I don't come to church for them to not make me happy.
for the last three weeks I have come to church and someone else has been sitting in my seat or in my pew. There's plenty of seats in this auditorium. They need to find another one. The church decided not to offer an early service anymore because only a few people were attending. Well, that's my service, and so if they're going to cancel the service I like to go to, then I'm going to go to a church that does. The pastor did not visit my sister's mother-in-law's cousin's second wife in the hospital, even though I told him to, and he doesn't even know who she is. Y'all laugh at that one. But the truth is, in some churches that I have served in, they would get, I have had people leave the church because we didn't visit their third cousin's second wife who had surgery who's never been to our church. We didn't even know her name. And we got there and used the name they gave us. That, they said, we don't even have somebody. We had to call on the phone because she has a different first name, but nobody calls her by her first name. But they got mad because we didn't end up staying. True story. The church voted to paint the worship center a different color than I voted for, pit different carpet than I voted for, and decided to move from pews to chairs. I'm so infuriated that my money did not go to where I said it was, so I will stop giving until they decide to do it my way. And let the church say, so y'all think it's funny, but these are things that have happened in real life. I have been, not here, and I hope to God never have to, but I have been in business meetings where arguments ensued over the color of a carpet or the style of a pew. You know, I've been in business meetings where it's like, well, I want the cross etched in the pew. And others will be like, well, no, I want a Bible etched in the pew. Others will be like, well, no, I think it needs to be a solid finish because if we ever need to use it for something, solid finish. And almost split the church because we can't decide if the cross should be etched in the pew or not. I've been in services where we argued over the fact that who got the rights to be able to put a plaque per window for the stained glass window dedication. And if somebody else gave more than Sister Johnny B. Jones's family and they decided they wanted, if we put two plaques on there, Johnny B. Jones's family's mad because she paid for it first. I don't care if Johnny B. Jones gave us $5,000 for the stained glass windows, but George Jones gave me $5 million. He's getting a plaque too. Because Johnny B. Jones is dead. I need that five million to put the next set in. Somebody put his name on that plaque. I've heard people argue about the color of carpet. You know, I've been in churches where the colors were down to two. We weren't even talking about multiple colors. We're down to two colors. A and B. There is no C. And somebody in the meeting says, I don't like either one. Let's add another one. How about we don't? Because the more I add, the more hell that ensues. No, I'm not doing that. We're down to burgundy and we're down to green. Then I've been in some services, y'all think I'm kidding, I've been in some places where it was down to hunter green versus olive green. We're still in the same pastel family. And they mad at the color green. That we're still in green. We ain't talking about another color, we in green. And we can't get along with green. And it made me green because they wouldn't stop talking about it. That's sick, y'all. Green, sick. I was sick about it. Stuff like that is crazy. But that is the me mentality. Church is about me. It's about me. You said it. Praise God, I didn't have to. Thank you, Jesus. So if anybody leaves the church, it's not because the preacher said that, okay? Just go on record. The preacher did not say that. Somebody else said that. It was of the devil. But the reality of it, it's simple things. Do you really think... God sits up in heaven and is proud that his church is splitting and arguing over the color of green a carpet is to be. When thousands of people are dying and going to hell, including our own family, our own sons and daughters, our own grandchildren, our own siblings, our own extended family, while the world is in shambles, we are arguing over green carpet, etched pews, name plaques on a wall, whether to go to LED or incandescent lighting systems. Putting up this TV screen versus not putting up a screen. It's not like we're showing HBO Cinemax on service on Sunday. This is just for people who can see because most of the people that come to church can't read their Bible and it's large print and they still can't use bifocals and read it. So they need something to see the word of the Lord on. So we put it in 2,000 point font on the screen. Amen. Brother Dennis likes it. Praise the Lord for somebody. Thank you, Jesus. I'm preaching better than I thought I was. Thank you, Lord. That's where we are. 
The world is in shambles. and I'm not saying us at this location, but I'm talking about the universal church. The world's in shambles. And the, the church that we are giving the world is something they, they don't even want to come to because we make it look miserable. We make it don't look appealing. We, they're like, if they can't get along with each other, why do I want to go and add extra drama to my life? I already got enough. I certainly don't need more. It's the way we are. It's where we're living. The biblical church life is different than the way we see it. It's about serving, sacrificing, giving, putting others before your own needs. Isn't that what the Bible says? Prefer your brothers. Prefer one another. It's about putting someone else before you. Jesus, what did he do at the Lord's Supper? He washed people's feet. Shouldn't he been the one, somebody was foot, that would have been getting his foot washed? But yet he did it for other people. Why? Because he was showing what it means to serve rather than to be served. He said the Son of Man came to serve rather than to be served and to give his life a ransom for many. He taught us we are to serve first and receive second. Churchianity is about being served, receiving, getting my own way. Here's another symptom. You have folks that like to dwell on the flaws. They complain. They nag. They want to remind you sometimes eloquently and sometimes not as eloquently. They want to remind you church isn't perfect. Well, honey, let me help everybody in the world with this one. The day that you came to church, the church changed from being perfect. I said that one time. It didn't go well. But I did say that one time to someone. They said, well, Pastor, this church is just not what I expect it to be. And I said, look, I said, when you go to a church and you find that it's perfect, will you promise me you'll do me one favor? And she said, yes, Pastor, I'll do what do you what, what, what would that be? I said, when you go that Sunday, will you go up to that pastor, be very polite and say, I like your church, but I'm not going to be able to come here anymore. And when he asks why, I say to him, because if I come, your church will no longer be perfect, and I don't want to mess up this perfect church you have. Because I said, because when you show up, that church will now no longer be perfect. She left my church, by the way. But I just want to go on record. Our church got per more perfect that day. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding about being more perfect. But the reality of it is, anytime you put humans together in a room, I'm going to just help y'all with something. If all y'all left tomorrow and didn't come back this weekend, and I was the only person to show up at the church on Sunday, I sang all the songs, I preached, and I put it on Facebook and YouTube by myself, I still would not be going to a perfect church because I'm not a perfect person. Because I still need the Savior. I still need to be redeemed. I still needed someone to die on the cross for me because I wasn't a perfect person. I'm still not a perfect person. So, you know what? Even if nobody else came, I still don't pastor the perfect church because sometimes, Brother James, I mess up too. So I'm not, it's not a perfect church. Y'all want to know something that's kind of scary and somewhat psychotic in the same time? Sometimes I don't even like me. Sometimes I don't like myself. That is, I know it's hard to believe, but sometimes me and myself and I, we don't like each other. The three of us get into fist fights and we argue with each other. We have conversations out loud with one another and I never know who actually wins. I don't know if me, myself, or I won, but somebody left that day not happy. And I have to live with all three of them because they all belong to me, me, myself, and I. There are certain times, Brother James, I hear a song that I picked out. I'll sing it on Sunday morning and I'll get in the car and I'll call Brianna and I'll be like, I hate that song. she say, you picked it. I said, I know and I still don't like it. There have been Sundays, some Sundays I leave church and I'll get in the car and we'll go to the restaurant and we'll get home that afternoon and she'll say, she'll say something and I'll say, yeah, I was like, I'm not going back tonight. And she said, why? I said, because I didn't like that message the preacher preached this morning. I'm not going back listening to that preacher preach again. That man's a jerk. I'm not going back listening to him. And she said, why did you say that? I said, I didn't like his message. I didn't like his tone. I didn't like the way he delivered it. In fact, I, I got nothing out of that message. I'm not going back and just wasting my time. And she said, and she's told me this before. It's kind of funny because uh, you're the preacher, so you probably need to go back. No, she just said, you're the preacher. You probably should go back. Because the reality is, I, 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 and, I, I'm, I, and I'll tell this on, on someone in here. Hopefully they won't shoot me hard because um, they have really good aim and they have a whole closet supply full of guns they could choose to shoot me with brother Randy um, but that being said so a couple weeks ago we were sitting in the office I don't remember I don't think Brandon was here we were sitting here something 
I remember, I think we were in the office, might have been up here, but it was just me, Brother Adams, Miss Carol, Brandon might have been there, and we were talking about stuff, and I said some comment, we were talking about church or something, and I said, yeah, sometimes I, I, don't, I don't like messages, this, that, and the other, and Miss Carol, because, you know, she's my mom and my boss and everything else in the world, she keeps me grounded, she helps me and Brother Randy to not get in trouble and go to jail, because more often than not, we'd end up in jail if she didn't say, don't do that. And uh, we would start our own jail ministry, preacher and council member in jail. It's not a good, 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 good record for us at the church. We don't want that kind of publicity. But we were sitting somewhere, and she said, you know, the last two and a half years you've been here, I've never heard you preach a bad message. And I looked at her, and I said, you are deaf. <laughs> no disrespect to you. But whatever Sunday that you thought it wasn't bad, I know you had to have headphones in. You weren't listening. She said, no, I'm telling you. I said, listen, I'm going to tell you. I appreciate the flattery, but you're also lying. I said, because I know there have been Sundays I got up there, and I know I didn't deliver it the way I needed, it, I wanted to, or it didn't come out the right way. There's been Sundays I left there, and I said, I told Brent, I'm like, that was, that was a dud. That was, I didn't get that right. That was this, that, and the other, whatever. And my point in saying all that is this, and while that was comical and I appreciated the flattery, I understand that church is not always going to be perfect. There's going to be a Sunday the media is going to fail. The air conditioning, we're going to show up on a Sunday morning, and all of a sudden we didn't realize that on Saturday night something happened to the unit, and it didn't work. Or we come in on a cold Sunday morning in January, and the heat pumps out in the air conditioning, and it won't work. I mean, in the heater, the air conditioning unit, and the heat won't work, and it's cold in here. There can be Sunday, some, we might come one Sunday, Brother James, that the power's knocked out. And we're going to have to do it with no lights, except the light on outside. Or if you've been at our church long enough, you know, we might come into one Sunday and the bathrooms are over flooded and nobody's been in them for two weeks. We don't know why, but we just have a living spring, spring up a well within my soul. And it just comes right up through the end. We're shot back in the bathroom. Some of y'all been here long enough to see it. There ain't been nothing happening. The water table just shows up. It's like the rivers of living water flowing right inside our church. We are definitely more biblical than any other church in this town. We have spring up a well and we have the rivers of living water flowing in our auditorium. Literally flowing. Do not plug a blow, a blow dryer or a curling iron in during that time during church. You will go up and smoke. But we have done it. We've seen it. It's not going to be perfect. There are going to be times that right in the middle of service, the internet stream is going to go down because it's technology. It's not perfect. See, we don't go to a perfect church, but there are some people, they only want to dwell on what all could go wrong. You could have a holy go. I've been in services. Holy Spirit's moved. There's been no preaching. They sang. Spirit moved. We've experienced that here before. Spirit's moved. People are in the altar. People are praying. I mean, it's just dynamite. I mean, you talk about service. Man, the Lord is in the house. And then you leave. And you, you're living on cloud nine. And you're thinking, you can't get no better than this. I mean, God is great. He's greatly to be praised. People have been worshiping. And you're just thinking, we're going to drop kick hell's door wide open. We're going to grab people out of the grips of hell. And we're going to bring them. I mean, we're ready. And then somebody calls on the phone. And they just take all that fire that's shut up inside your bones. And they just shoot a whole gallon of water on it. And watch it just be smoldered out. And just, just kill it. I mean, you're living on cloud nine. From a preacher's perspective, I've had services like that, and somebody calls. Pastor, you got a minute? I mean, we ain't even got out of church for 15 minutes. Yes, ma'am, man, or yes, sir, can I help you? Why did sister so-and-so go up that altar this morning? Who cares? I don't really know. Don't care. Don't ask. Well, ain't your business. Ain't none of my business. Well, you really think she got what she needed? I don't know. Ask her and ask God. I'm not God. Well, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if all of that was the Holy Spirit this morning. Some of that might have been emotionalism. Well, you know what? You and God have a little talk with Jesus and make it right. And don't call me. Shut up. I don't want to know. Because whether it's right or not, whether at the end of the day, you, you, and you, some of you probably experienced too, you, you think you come out of good service or you felt great and somebody calls you and they just know how to just ruin your day. You may have the best day ever and they just know how to just... They always look for what's wrong. Look, we're all not perfect. There's going to be a lot of what's wrong in our lives. But there's a lot of what's right because God's still good. So for everything we can find wrong, there's a lot of us that can find a lot of good things that are right because of the way God's been in our lives. So we can't be critical of everything because we're not perfect. Let me, let me, I don't, you know, want to hurt your feelings anymore. But I want to read some of the, some of the other examples for um, the issues that the, 
dwelling on flaws people face. In 1 Corinthians, the Bible talks about the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth and he addressed some of their issues that they were having. Now some of the churches in today's society may not face these same issues, but I want to read to you some of these flaws that Paul had to call out that they had. Some of these issues were the church members had cliques and had formed personality cults where they made sure only certain people were allowed to be in their group and anyone else was not around. That's a good way to kill your church. They also faced the idea of significant amount of carnal behavior infiltrated the leadership of the church. That's in the world today. Church members and leaders did not deal with the sexual immorality and sexual perversion that was happening within the church. And I would add to that, in the day and hour we're living in, we're not only not dealing with it inside the church and teaching it right inside the church, but we're also helping by going to certain voting stations and polls, and we're promoting that it continue to happen. There was a significant level of worldliness and materialism. Church members were taking each other to court and suing one another. Rebellion was happening against the apostolic authority, meaning pastors. There was people rebelling against spiritual authority. The church did not handle the discipline, the discipline of members who had fallen into sin. You know, in every church denomination, including the Church of God, there is an actual element in every church government, including the minutes of the Church of God, of how to deal with church discipline. And there are certain times that you can actually turn someone out of the church biblically based on Scripture. You don't hardly ever see it happen. But Paul addressed it and said it can happen. People were debating questioning and had a misunderstanding of spiritual gifts. Some were abusing the Lord's Supper. Some were taking the abuse of liberty and freedom in Christ and thought it was a free will, a free pass to sin because the grace of God covered it all so they felt like they could just sin and do whatever they want to. That's not how the grace of God works. They were dealing with heresies concerning the resurrection. There was people inside the church trying to say that Jesus didn't really resurrect. Think about that. Before we close tonight, I want to Talk about one more thing about these traps. You have some people that have low expectations of church. They come. They, they might do a little bit here and there, but they don't want the church to ever be different. Let the church just stay the way it is. Don't change it. Don't do anything. Just let it stay. Now, I'm going to be real frank with you before we close here in just a second. One of the things I've learned a long time ago that if you keep doing what you've always done, you're going to keep getting the same results you always got. Now, I'm not saying you throw the baby out the bathwater. If, you, if you've been preaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit and people keep getting filled with the Holy Spirit, then keep preaching on it. It's working. But if you started out, said a pastor goes to a church and it's running 250 people when he arrives. And five years later, the church is running 25 people. Whatever he's been doing ain't working. Okay. Now you might can say people have different personality quirks and things like that. Eventually, it's more than just personality quirks. It just ain't working. Sometimes you have to shake it up a little bit, change it up. What are some of these low expectations that people have? See, I, I've thought about this, and I read this the other week, and it kind of, I read it a long time ago, and I brought it back out. There was a church that a lady visited. I won't say the church. She visited and never was contacted from them. She'd been going there for weeks. Ended up going there for months. Ended up going there for over a year. No correspondence. When asked after a year when she left the church, when asked by someone why she left, here's what she said. For the entire last year, I got one piece of communication from the church. It wasn't a text message from a pastor or a leader. It wasn't a bulletin. It wasn't a get well card. The one piece of communication that I received from the church right after I started attending and after I was notified that I was now a member of the church, they did not ask me about joining a class. They didn't tell me about a Sunday school class. They didn't tell me about any ministries. But they did send me a box of tithing envelopes and said, please use at your discretion. And I never heard anything back from them since. See, some of the things that I think create low expectations in the church, some churches don't have like things like, now for some churches it doesn't work, but for some it does. They don't have new member classes. 
the entry level point where people can get to know one another or join fellowship with one another. They don't do small groups or what we call Sunday school classes for people to get in smaller segments to be able to dialogue and talk together. They have one big giant worship service, but everybody's just a number and nobody knows who the person is sitting beside them in the pew. They don't try to move members towards involvement and volunteering. They don't communicate. They don't tell them anything about the church. They just hope they keep coming and keep putting money in the pot. Because that's all they're concerned about. And the last symptom that we'll talk real quick before we pray is the cliquish members. Oftentimes certain ministries or meetings can become very cliquish in nature. It's human nature. We, human nature is we gravitate typically to people that we have like interest in. For me, I'm typically going to sit at a table with people who talk about sports. When I was in high school, I did not hang out with people who made straight A's and were really smart. I punched people like I did not really hit them. Back that up. I appreciated their eloquence. I threatened them like, hey, I'm putting you in a trash can. Hey, what did you get for number three on your homework? Because I don't want to fail this quiz. That was not me either, but my friends did that. That's the table I sat at. The point to be made, though, is I did not hang out with all the smart kids. Because smart kids, and I didn't really, I mean, we might have a little bit in common, but they were also at times annoying. They were the people wearing the glasses, and you're afraid they were going to be the ones that, if something had happened at the school, they'd be the ones that do it because they could hack the computer system and change the whole world in five minutes. I hung out with athletes because we could talk about who had the highest batting average, who had the highest free throw percentage, who was playing in the basketball playoffs. That's what we liked. So I hung out with them. It was unintentional. I didn't try, but we found people like that. People do that. Musicians, they'll talk music stuff. They'll hang out together. Sports people. And people like to hang out or talk. People that like to fish, they'll all fish together. They go, honey, they, 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 they gravitate to people like that. And that's okay. The problem is it can't be that way in church. Because what happens in the church, certain ministries, certain meetings, they become clicky to nature. They have a power struggle. It's like this group is against the pastor. Or this group's against this family. Or this group. It's like a power struggle of pastor versus power playing of a family. It's like this group says, look, I've been going to this church long and this pastor's been here. So either he does it our way or we starve him out. And this group over here is like, yeah, but I used to be in. And it's like turf wars and everybody's battling for their own spot on the, on the playing field. And, and, and what happens is, is innocent people get lost in the shuffle or get hurt sometimes in the shuffle. Maybe not lost, maybe hurt. A lot of times, while we gravitate towards people that are like-minded, you know, for people in this church, there are some people coming to our church, they're suits and tie guys. Brother Barnes, for an example, he tries to outdress me every Sunday. He's almost caught me. He's not there yet, but he's gotten close. I've had to up my game. He's got close. I pick on him all the time. I say, well, you're, getting, you're getting good at this game. You're getting real good. I'm having to buy more stuff to keep up with you. The reality of it is he's a suit and tie guy. Every Sunday, he's going to be in a suit and tie. That's fine. That's great. I got guys that come to church in PFGs, professional fishing gear, shirts, blue jeans, and Sperry's. You know what? I'm jealous. I hate professional fishing gear because it don't look good on me, and I don't know what it means. I know it's something to do with fishing. I couldn't catch a fish if it jumped in the boat and said, I'm just going to hang out with you for the day. I still wouldn't catch him. But I'm envious of the guys that can wear that. I'm envious a little bit. They come. They're all cool casual. I'm like, man. I want to be com- I want to be I want to be comfortable like that guy. I don't even know what your shirt means, but you look good. That's okay. There are people that come to this church. Some come dressed like they're going to meet the president of the United States. There are others that come that they are just comfortable in their own skin. That's good. That's cool. That's great. There are some people that come to the church driving expensive cars. There are some people come to church. They got four different tires on the car. Not one of them match. It's okay. See, the reality of it is, I know that on a Sunday morning, I may have sitting over here a fisherman and a hunter and another hunter that sits behind him. And then the guy behind him might put in security systems so that these people don't break into his house. (laughs) That's okay. That's okay. I may have... People that have corporate jobs, and people that have worked in big industries. I may mean, have military men that served in high rankings of military that can talk to people like Brother Barnes and others. Of mili- I couldn't tell you anything about the military. I couldn't tell you what rank it was. I couldn't even tell you. If I went in the military, I'd probably be, they'd kick me out. They'd be like, you're not even worth keeping. Like, it's just, just go home. I couldn't be like Justin. I mean, Justin looks like he's like running for the next, you know, 
Terminator, Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. He's all buff, ready to take on the world. I'm over here looking like the guy sitting in the computer in the back of the van, like, hey, there's somebody coming around building number three. <laughs> like, I'm, I understand that. But, you know, Justin could come any Sunday and walk right behind this podium and stand right in front of that guy right there. They could talk about military stuff that would blow my head off. I would be like, what are y'all talking about? Why don't y'all talk what normal people talk? Ain't nobody knows what y'all talking about. They could talk about ranking. They could talk about military. They could talk about strategy. They could talk about the Citadel. They could talk about all the statuses and all that. They, all the, how to dress and how to do this and how to do that. And I'd be like, dude, I just, I just learned how to tie my shoes yesterday. I don't care what down the knots are like. That's okay. I may have people that are retired from different jobs. Or, and I may have the next person in the end of the pew that are just getting good and started in a career. See, the beauty about church is I don't have to necessarily, and some people get get upset and messed up with this stuff, I don't always have to be able to be like-minded in all of their special interests they do outside of the church, but when we come together, we're family. My brother might like to fish. That's great. I may not be that guy. Just like in our own biological families, one person might be a neat freak, and the other person looks like they don't even care what they could find their clothes in the room because it's so dirty. But they still go to family reunion together and they still eat at mama's table on Mother's Day and say, that's my sister and that's my brother because they're biologically connected. It's the same way. There's people, we have a whole diverse group of people that walk in this building every week. That's okay. The thing about church is we never can allow church to be like, well, I'm only going to talk to the people who are just like me and ostracize everybody who are not like me. Because whether we like it or not, if we all get saved and truly saved, we're family whether we like each other or not. You sometimes don't like your brother and you sometimes don't like your sister, but the old adage, blood is in water, you may not like them, but they still belong to your family. When we get a part of the family of God, I may not always like you, I may not always agree with you, and we may not always see eye to eye, but if we love Jesus, we all are still family, whether we like it or not. We can't let folks be left out, especially when they're new to the church. Man, I've, I've said one of the things I'm proud of about our church, more so, I, mean, I can't speak to other churches, but one thing I've always prided ourselves on is when new people come, that people talk to them, and they always talk about how friendly people were, or how somebody invited them, or how somebody sat with them, or somebody talked to them, or whatever. I always, I, I love that, and it breaks my heart when I hear people's stories about they went to a church and nobody knew their name, nobody asked them how they were, nobody missed them the Sunday they were out. They were just a number, not a name. It breaks my heart when people feel like they go places and nobody cares one iota if they showed up or not. Man, that rips my heart out of my chest. Because that's not how, because God knows, every, the Bible says he knows the number of hair I have in my head. That means God is very much so wanting to know every detail about people. That's what we're supposed to be. It keeps the church, if we're not careful, these cliquish mentalities will put us in ruts. It'll make it hard for the church to grow because who wants to go to a place that they don't feel wanted? Or welcomed? Or needed? Who wants to go to church and they walk in for the first time, Brother Robert, and they walk through the doors and this group's all talking right here, and this group's talking right here, and this group's talking right here, and even when we do the two minutes, two and a half minutes of meet and greet on Sunday morning, they talk here, they talk here, they talk here, and he just stands here for two minutes and 30 seconds, and not one person says, hello, how are you, my name's Larry, my name's Randy, my name's Jim, everybody else moves for two minutes and 30 seconds. Brother Jeff here stands all by himself. Don't know nobody. Never met a person in his life. You know what we just told him? We don't care. We don't need you. We don't care. See, I've always, this is, I'm going to pray after this. One of the things that I always used to do uh, when we had this at other churches I served in, we had these meet and greets, especially when I didn't have to play, and it was digitally done with music playing through the system or whatever. I would, the first song, what we call the call to worship in, our, in, our, in my churches I've served at in the past, it was like our hymn, and then we'd do the, like we do here, we'd have the preacher come up or whatever and do all that stuff. And what I would do when we'd play the call to worship, I'd look throughout the audience and I'd see if there's people there I didn't recognize. I, mean, I would literally look while I was playing to see if there's just maybe one or two people in the crowd that I haven't seen, or maybe I haven't seen them in a really long time. I recognize their face, but I really didn't remember their name, but they look kind of familiar, but we're really not sure if they were familiar or way out, but I didn't really know they were. And when the meet and greet would happen, I, and I was on staff at this church, I'd have some people trying to catch, hey pastor, hey pastor, and I'd be like, hey, how you doing? Hey, good seeing you. Hey, good, good seeing you. And I'd almost like just push them off, and they'd be like, wow, that was rude. You know what? Because I didn't need to talk to Sister Sally. I already knew her. 
I already knew she didn't like the way I played. She's told me that plenty of times. I didn't need her to tell me that again. I knew that. I know that she's, she's having a birthday party this weekend. She wants me to come. But she also doesn't like the way I play, so I'm not going. I know that her favorite color is purple. I know she likes catfish stew. And I know that she doesn't like the air conditioning in the church. I know that. I don't need to talk to her anymore to find out what else is wrong with the church. She's told me enough the last six weeks that I talked to her. What I don't know is Billy Bob in that back row. I ain't never seen him before. That's the guy I need to I want to know about him. Because on Wednesday night, she's still going to come back, Brother James, and tell me everything went wrong at church on Sunday. And so I get plenty of face time with her. But I don't know if I ever get a chance to talk to Billy Bob again. See, there's a lot of us in this room. We've been going to church together so long. We, we've got family connections. We, 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 we are connected. We are, some of us are here. We've got more connections. we third cousins, second cousins, first cousins. We're not even sure if we're not married to a cousin because there's so many of us. We don't know who's who in the family. We all intertwine somehow. This co- I met, I, well, we like double cousins. Like my cousin married his cousin and his cousin married their cousin. So we like triple cousins. I'm like, my gosh, go. y'all need to stop getting out of the family tree. Y'all's tree ain't even a tree. It's like a circle. Y'all need to get out the tree. Find a different one. Move from the dogwood to the pine tree. Move over trees. Go, go somewhere. Get out the tree. People are all connected. We know each other. There's people here. Like Andrew, for example. I can use him, for example, and then we pray. Like Andrew, I don't need to talk to him and meet and greet on Sunday morning. I know him. I grew up with him. We have done a lot of things that probably should have put us in jail. We didn't go. Thank God. We know that. God's good. I don't need to ask him. I mean, I talked to him this week on the phone. I can ask him about his mom and dad. I don't have to go on Sunday morning and be like, hey, Andrew, how's your mom and dad? I already know. I could call his mom right now on the phone if I wanted to. I got a number in my phone. But I might have someone like Jeff who comes every other week with his work schedule where he works at Walmart that came by my office about a month ago and sat in my office for two hours. And I've heard his life story. I don't know a lot about him, but maybe that maybe the Sunday he needs me to just say hello to him. Because he, I don't know a lot about Jeff. I know a lot about Andrew. We grew up together. See, I can almost in this room, almost, tell something, whether it's personal in nature or something of connection or connectivity to everybody sitting in this room today. Or whether it's been what I've known about you for the last two and a half years, or some of y'all know me when I was still in diapers. Some of y'all thought, God, he never would turn out to be a preacher like that. And then you're thinking, God, why did you make me have to sit under him? I wasn't expecting this. I know that. There's, we've been, there's a lot of stories for all of us in here. Connections. Some of us have went to church together before, been before here. Some of us have done music together. Some of us have connections at churches I've served at in other places. You didn't go to church with me, but half your family went to church with me or knew of me. And so y'all were able to call and ask them, hey, are we getting a crazy dude or not before we vote this man in? Y'all tell us about it. Y'all could call and ask questions before I even showed up. Some of y'all should have called other people I'm right now. Just think, you're probably thinking, God, I should have called one more person. I can probably tell you about anything personal. About it, but what if this Sunday morning, Mother's Day, or Sunday night, or on a Wednesday night. Someone shows up that I don't quite know them. I might know of them, heard of them, met them twice, but I don't know a lot about them. I may not need to go talk to Miss Ann one more service, because I know on next Sunday she'll be here, or next Wednesday she'll be here. But I may need to this Sunday bypass my two minutes of talking to Miss Ann to talk to them. So we have to make sure that in the church that we live in, when people come, that we make sure that we never let someone leave our property that thinks they were not as important to us as anybody else in this building. Because when they go to heaven, you're not going to be any more important to Jesus than they are because Jesus loves us all the same. And if we're supposed to go and do everything he commanded us to likewise do, that means we have to love them just like he loved them and witness and talk to them just like he would have done. This is a group effort. We cannot... Make sure, we have to make sure that we avoid traps. Do not get sucked into these different schemes and traps that, that the enemy places. We have to avoid the traps. Let's stand all over the house this evening. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. And immediately following this prayer, we will be dismissed. Heavenly Father, thank you today for your love, mercy, and grace. Thank you, your very present help in time of trouble. Thank you, you have been a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Father, I pray that you would go before us, you'd lead God and protect us. And your face would be upon us and be gracious to us. You lift your countenance upon us. Lord, I pray tonight, Lord, that when we leave this place, we will let these words resonate in our heart and speak to our, speak to our hearts. Lord, we're not going to be victimized by the traps and the snares the devil may throw our way. But, Lord, we're going to do everything we can to advance your kingdom.
power and the glory and the fellowship of your sufferings and the power of your resurrection. Go with us. Keep us safe. Bring us back safely this weekend to celebrate Mother's Day. Help us to have a good week. Help all of the requests we prayed for earlier. We commit them into your care. And Lord, we just give you the praise and the glory and the honor that is due your name. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, we pray and ask all these things. And the people of God together said amen. 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 God bless you. We'll see you this weekend.